Now we've put this very professionally with zip ties and duct tape onto a flashlight. And uh, we are able to strap a spotlight in Unreal that looks exactly like a flashlight fall off and literally just have that come to life <laughs> in the scene in real time. Oh, So Mike, we are on the coolest playground I've ever seen, personally. Uh, we, you are the expert here, so walk us through what this is. I know I have one on my phone, but how is this different? Essentially, this is a very expensive motion-captured camera. Uh, a lot of bells and whistles, and it's very light for testing. You see we have a rig rail, we have some pieces on top, and of course we have our lenses that we can play with just like you can at home with some basic photography stuff. The difference being that we are tying this directly into Unreal Engine so we can capture live footage with a digitally tracked environment. Uh, what we have here is what I like to call the Sputnik. Uh, a lot of other studios will call it a mine, some will call it a satellite, but it is a constellation of infrared markers sitting on a metal frame and then measured to the distance of the lens. So in Unreal, there is a camera sitting here and we've told it to essentially move down in distance to the, the, the front of the camera here so we can track it on the wall. Each of these little ping pong ball markers are active, which is uh, uh, the difference between a, a motion capture suit ping pong ball marker and something that we need to be picked up by the computer and be sub-millimeter accurate at all times. What I'd like to explain next is that while we are tracking this in digital space, uh, the accurate lens focus and aperture. So if I could have one of you gentlemen please stand on the blue little triangle markers back there. And if you guys like to go on the, uh, the Shogun here. Essentially, I can focus on you and then the digital content will be physically and perspectively accurate. And then I can dial you down in darkness or brightness from there all on the physical camera. Now, all this data is getting beamed back to my control station in the back and recorded in Unreal as well. So we can do live comp and digital comp in real time. So after I'm done with this, we can call cut, we can send this off to a vendor, we can work on it ourselves, and it will always be the same shot. Say uh, uh, we messed something up, we have to come back three months later, I wore the wrong tie. The lighting is always going to be the same. You're not traveling with a team of 150 people out to the desert and only shooting for 15 minutes of sunlight. Uh, you are saving countless hours and uh, the accuracy and continuance of the scene is going to be accurate. No one's going to say, oh, there's my Starbucks cup that I left in scene eight. You know, it's, it, that can always be moved. So I'm going to boom a little bit to the right and left and just look at how the scene shifts in perspective. This allows me to go around corners. What you couldn't do before with LED technology as your backdrop for productions was really explore the environment. You were stuck with just uh, the 2D parallax shift that we've had since Snow White. Now you can actually punch in, you can have the stage travel down a road for an infinite uh, car loop. There's a lot more to explore here. Now, the shift may seem a little exaggerated here, but what's happening is the engine is calculating via end display, which is the, uh, the IP that allows this to be solved, and solving for the correct perspective to always be in place on the, uh, the monitor here. We also have props that we can use. Uh, so what this is, is this is an OptiTrack puck. Uh, this has a flat four star constellation with passive markers. So this is just, the camera's just picking up the infrared. It's not pulsating at a micro frequency and being identified. Now we've put this very professionally with zip ties and duct tape onto a flashlight. <laughs> and uh, we are able to strap a spotlight in Unreal that looks exactly like a flashlight fall off and literally just have that come to life <laughs> in the scene in real time. Oh, man. And I can walk up to the wall and this will get, get a little smaller there. And you can see I'm losing signal because I'm going inside the camera frame, but go ahead and give that a one, two. Wow, I'm like a real life tune right here. So that illuminates in depth. You are as I said, uh, in a 3D environment. This is, uh, this is a window and not necessarily a wall, and that's the best way to kind of think about the ICVFX space, is you can explore anywhere, you can do anything. It is a game engine, it's an if-then logic statement. So there's no limits to what you can do, aside from the speed and optimization of the content. Okay, we turn the flashlight on, it's a little weak, doesn't really match the color. But if you need to do a pickup and say, oh man, I, it sure is dark over there. I don't know what I need to do. I'm just gonna do this and then turn off the light and now we have that there. Wow. So there are ways you can explore certain shots in whatever film or uh, digital piece you're doing and uh, you know, get creative with it.
So much, like, obviously we see this blue frame. Do you have a, what's the technical term? Yes, yeah, so this is what's called the inner frustum. Now, if you were to take a box and expand it up to the wall from the camera lens, that's essentially what you're seeing here. So this starts to bow out because it's on a curved surface, but the camera and Unreal Engine are solving that to put that back into a perfectly square option for final recording. I can't stress enough, I am a dummy and an idiot. Oh. What are all of these sensors? I mean, they have ah. to play a very important role. Yeah, so these are uh, essentially what you see in your uh, generic motion capture volume, right? Um, infrared cameras have been around for a very, very long time. We've just kind of repurposed these for tracking whatever we need for motion capture data. That's essentially it. That's the magic behind the sauce here is because uh, if you don't have this data flowing into Unreal or flowing to the wall, uh, we're stuck with just a, a background. There's no perspective change. So the more cameras you have shooting into a volume, the more coverage you get. The more coverage you get, the smaller distance you can track. So uh, we have an abundance of cameras here just to kind of help us out with all of our research, development, innovation, and testing that we do here at the lab. How, how, how big is like, you're, you're sending to the vendors, they, you can come back, you can tweak it. I mean, it's all super collaborative and like easy to edit. How big are these files? Like, what, what's the data like? So it really depends on what you're shooting. A scene like this that's static, there's no massive crowd, it's pretty lightweight. Uh, you're just tracking the camera movement and I can export just the camera. So, you know, you work on this on your home file, you can work on a Pentium 5 processor and just keep going like the old days. Or uh, you could send the entire world and you know, you're looking at 20 to 100 gigs, depending on how complex you're, you're doing it, which is pretty light considering today's gaming updates. Yeah. So uh, it really depends on what you're shooting. Like the, the footage though on the camera is really gonna hit you. Yeah. So I mean, we're working with professional Hollywood quality uh, equipment. We're trying to get squeeze every pixel for its last drop. So that's where you start getting hard drives worth of data for maybe 10 minutes of shooting. Was there like a major difference when you use Unreal Engine 5 for games versus using Unreal Engine 5 for movies and TV? Like what's the big difference there? Uh, the thought process and how you approach it. You're, it's still a gaming process, like uh, the speed is the most important. The content has to be up to speed in order to match the 24 FPS that we're gonna record for film or TV. You have to think of uh, what you're going to do for the shot as well. That in Hollywood, you don't build the entire world. You just build what you wanna see in camera and whatever that camera is going, uh, going to be. So if the director on the day says, you know what, this shot's just not working out, let's flip 180 degrees and there's no world, uh, suddenly you know, you're back at square one. Okay. So uh, thinking of it like a game environment and building a city uh, in its complexity for like a, a four block radius or something like that and planning for that, that's the thought process where games really contributes to the Hollywood process. Uh, there's, we leave room for plan B, C, D through Z. I love the idea of like you build these massive world for your movie. Let's yeah. plug that immediately in and make the game version. We can release that when the movie comes out. Exactly. Oh, yeah. yeah, have you noticed how much shorter the time between the game release and the DVD release and every all the pickups have come? Like, this, is, this is exactly it. Yeah. All the VR experiences. Yeah, we have we the Matrix Awakens demo before the movie even came out. <laughs> That's true. That's true. All right, I want to play with Sputnik now. How do we do it? All right. That? So we, <laughs> we might. Just give me something I can break. <laughs> So currently I'm in the environment, I am taking this flashlight that we were just tracking. Yeah. I'm going to turn off the flashlight's projection so it does not affect our world. And I'm going to tell the flashlight to stop listening to this OptiTrack puck. And now I'm going to tell our camera B that we don't have displayed yet uh, to start looking for that, that OptiTrack puck. All right. All so right. let's step out let's front. Let's do it. Wow. All I, yours, I'm sir. absolutely ready. Go for it. Whoa. Now this one, you can see, obviously, uh, the frostum is like, and that's yes. because these aren't active, right? Right, so the cameras are solving for passive markers. Uh, they're trying to, you know, spend more computation power on that. It's also, as I said, sub-millimeters, so that, that shake in our hands is also the shake in the system. And then now you've, you've passed the boundary to see, you see where the cameras are up here? Yeah. So the closer you get to that veil, it's, and you've blocked it with your body, all these cameras back here cannot pick it up, all these cameras back here cannot pick it up. So there, there are rules, there are boundaries that we have to stay within when we're using ICD effects. There are puzzles for every shot. <laughs> <laughs> I climb up. Oh. Go, go, go. <laughs> I can't lift you too. Oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh 
Wow, just the parallax effect is insane. Yeah, it's, it's just crazy. Like, like I can, like, can like I, I here. can see. Wait, go back here. I want to see around this rock. Let's see around this rock here. I'm. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I left my keys back there. <laughs> there it is. There they are. <laughs> and you can see, obviously, because of the perspective of the camera, you can see how it's changing for our eyes. Right. So that's exactly what we just talked about. If that were a photography lens or a uh, camera lens here, this bow would be perfectly straight in the final footage. Like, it, there would be no distortion problems. But because we're mapping to a curved circuit, surface or even a linear one, it has to solve for that and then account for the nodal distortion. Oh, yeah. I oh, shit. I am. And you broke it. Four hundred thousand dollars. It's been, a, it's been a theme this weekend. <laughs> I get this, this the whole time. I never <laughs> the, uh, what we like to do with this as well is like, you, you have a very heavy camera. It's 40 pounds that you could put on, you gotta carry. I can take it off that gib and we can move it around. But prior to knowing what our shot is, I can take something as small as this and then just really get more dynamic action shots and track that. So if we have a robotic arm moving the, the camera on the day, uh, and I kinda wanna get a sense for what that might look like before we program it, uh, this is an easy and awesome iterative tool to, to get that going. Does like actual reality annoy you now that you can't control it as much as you can control this? <laughs> a, a little bit, yeah. I, I've had the wireframe dream. I've, uh, you know, I've gone outside, so that's fake. Yeah, it all happens here. Wait a minute, this floor isn't real? <laughs> it's the volume! <laughs> These are also screens. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mike. This no. is insane this and is... Uh, magic. <laughs> It's a little bit of information overload. It's just oh, like, uh, yeah, what it takes to pull this off is truly magic. And uh, I can't wait for uh, people to get these tools in their hands. Yeah. Which they can, right? They can right they can now. It's all free. They can do it. Yeah, so uh, if you actually want to learn how to do this, this is this template, these project templates are free to download with the engine. All the objects that you see in here are uh, through Megascans. Those are free as well. So you want to start kit bashing new environments, throwing them together like Lego sets. You can do this on a home monitor for uh, fairly, fairly cheap. Just yeah. a simple if iPad you, or something is all you need. Yeah, and if you want to go as like big a scale as this, you can get one of these torches real cheap. I'm selling them on my website. It's IGN.com. <laughs> <laughs>